In the summer of 1974, a nationalist councillor in County Tyrone drove straight into the hands of his killers. But the men who murdered Patsy Kelly on a narrow country road have never been brought to justice. Tonight, Insight examines serious allegations of security force involvement in Patsy Kelly's killing. If we can't find out what the truth is, if we can't find the truth, then the wounds inside just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. The Northern Ireland Police Service maintains that, like all unsolved murders, the case remains open. But how serious can we take such claims when the police admit they have lost the murder file? The loss of such a high-profile murder file has not only exposed the police to ridicule, it has also meant that a former UDR major is finding it all but impossible to defend himself from what he terms a Republican whispering campaign accusing him of involvement in the killing. That the retired UDR man is now a DUP assemblyman has raised the stakes dramatically. Tonight, for the first time, Oliver Gibson speaks on television of his fight to clear his name. If any unionist or any member of any security force had been even remotely or dreamed of, of being near such a murder, they would have been certainly spent a long time being interrogated and investigated. It was on this stretch of isolated road that Patsy Kelly was murdered. An independent nationalist councillor, he died less than a mile from his home. It appears that only his killers know why they murdered Patsy Kelly here and then drove over 15 miles to dump his body in a Fermanagh lake. Certainly it appears that the REC know less about the crime today than they did back in 1974. Patsy Kelly's family believe his murder was never properly investigated and want the case reopened so that they can find out exactly what happened here 27 years ago. In the heart of rural Tyrone lies the constituency once represented by Councillor Patsy Kelly. It is here that his death is still so keenly felt. Despite the passing of the years, his family continues to live with not only the grief, but the rumour and suspicion of who is behind his killing. Now that I have grandchildren, I would love that the truth was here, that I could say to them, look, answer them, like what I always had to say to the, my own family, look, these cruel men took your father away from from us. Patsy Kelly was a family man born and raised in the close-knit community of Trillick. By the late 60s he had married and started a family, setting up home on the slopes of Brocker Mountain. At the same time he was becoming aware of the injustices amidst this rural idyll and was attracted to the civil rights movement and later became an independent nationalist councillor sitting on Oma Council. I think that the unionist community viewed people like me and people like Patsy Kelly that there was somebody that was, uh, as the term was then, or used quite commonly, a subversive. The nature of the conflict in the urban centres of Belfast and Derry was completely different to that in the lanes and fields of West Tyrone. By 1974, the Stormont government had collapsed, unionism was in revolt, and Northern Ireland was witnessing new scales of terrorism. In rural areas, neighbour was pitted against neighbour. Farmers by day became soldiers at night. It's an extremely intense time. It is a time when no unions could consider their life safe. It is a time when people were deliberately fingered by their neighbours. At the time, the IRA in Tyrone was mounting a concerted campaign, especially against members of the security forces, many of them murdered while off duty. For unionists in rural areas, the UDR had replaced the B-specials as their first line of defence, but for many nationalists, the local soldiers were no guardians. Oh, I got a lot of hassle. It's an amazing amount of hassle I got. As soon as I, uh, I would have been stopped at a roadblock, I knew it was not going to be easy. Uh, on one occasion, uh, a gun was held to my head, and the safety catch was clicked on and off. Um, I'd been always held for a, a long period of time. I wasn't actually ever ass assaulted. I was threatened quite often. But, I mean, that, that was part and parcel of the time. 
Okay, Patsy, all the best. See you. Patsy Kelly had been running a bar in Trillick for only a few months when he headed out of the village towards home in the early hours of July 24th, 1974. He set off in his car to drive the two miles along the narrow country roads. He was always wary on the journey given that he regularly carried the night's takings with him. But within minutes of leaving the pub, he drove into a roadblock set up not by thieves, but by murderers. You open your boot, sir. I waited as usual that night for him to come home. I would have always stayed up, you know, waited on him. And that night I uh, waited and I had closed the gates in the evening time to keep the children off the road. And I remember then at around 12 o'clock I thought, almost open the gates and go see if past seven. So I went out and opened the gates. And where it all? No, Patsy. By next morning, there was still no sign of Patsy Kelly. Family, friends, and neighbours began a search of the fields and ditches between the village and the Kelly home. As the search continued, Teresa Kelly, who remained with the couple's young children, was sick with worry. She would later discover that she was pregnant with her fifth child. And we waited on all evening. Not. Oh, there was a lot of hustle and bustle and all, and uh, in the evening time then, uh, I were sitting here and poor mummy that stayed and gone, now she was here and she said, Tracy, you should go to bed now because you're going to have a very long day tomorrow again. And I said, oh, mummy, I'm not going to bed till Patsy comes home. And she says, well, Tracy, you needn't expect Patsy home because she said there was blood and hair, blood and hair and buttons got on the road. She says, Patsy will we'll come home. That was the worst, but I never expected anything like that to happen. On the basis of the evidence found on the roadside, the police had come to the same conclusion as Theresa Kelly's mother and began a widespread search for a body. Within hours, Patsy Kelly's car was found burned out over 10 miles from Trillick at Rupra, and the search was broadened to include the shores of Upper Loch Ern. There is a body missing, and that body is important to us as police and very important to the relatives. We anticipated the worst from the start. We are going full out as a murder search. Patsy Kelly had been shot four times in the chest. His body had been bundled into a car, and despite the numerous security checkpoints in the area at the time, spirited away from the scene. His killers drove through the night to lock eyes near Lisbalaw in County Fermanagh, a distance of almost 15 miles. There they used a 56 pound weight and a nylon rope to send Patsy Kelly's body to the bottom, where it stayed for almost three weeks before resurfacing. I remember uh, Father Breen and I think it was Inspector Robinson maybe coming and saying that the body was found. And I just, a relief, a sigh of relief that I got. I thought, this is, at least this is the end of now. We have the body and hopefully now that nothing happened. The UDA claimed the murder but neither police nor nationalists believed it had been involved. Instead, focus was placed on the possible involvement of the UDR, which locally had been accused of violent behaviour against nationalists. Cited as possible motivation was the IRA murder of a part-time UDR man, Robert Jemison, earlier that year. There was only, what, six or seven months of a difference between the two. So, I mean, obviously when, when Jemison was shot, I mean, that stunned the community. I think we all had, you know, our fears then as to, you know, who might be next. And then when uh, Patsy Kelly was killed, well then, obviously then, I mean, who was going to be the next? 22-year-old Robert Jemison was shot dead by the IRA after he got off a bus just a few miles outside Trillick. His mother, on her way to collect him, found him lying dead in the road. I didn't know Robert Jemison personally, but I just remember that particular event. It was a tragic event, as is any other sudden, dramatic, tragic death such as that.
Teresa Kelly prayed for her husband's killers and concentrated on raising her young family. She remained convinced that an arrest would be forthcoming. After all, it was what the investigating officer had told her. I was up, so, you know, as soon as the body would be found, that, you know, that there would have been somebody arrested or questioned or something about it. They told you that yeah. they thought that they had enough evidence? Yeah, to be they able said they had enough evidence there if, the if there was a body found. But despite such promising beginnings, little was done to apprehend her husband's killers. The key question is, why? The family would harbour the deep suspicions that this, in fact, was a, a state killing carried out by members of the security forces. There is no knowledge at this point in time at what level prior sanction was given by the security forces to the killing. But what the family is clearly alleging is that following Patsy Kelly's death, all branches of the security forces from the British Army through the Ulster Defence Regiment and the Royal Ulster Constabulary conspired to uh, provide alibis and therefore to ensure that the killers of Patsy Kelly would escape from justice. The awful truth behind the Kelly investigation was only to emerge three months ago when RUC Detective Superintendent Brian MacArthur finally agreed to meet the Kelly family solicitor, Pat Fahey. Fahey took the precaution of recording the conversation. Well, I have said that the entirety of the claim does not exist, Mr. Fahey. Well, just to, to place it on record, Troy, you want to say something? Sorry, sorry. Uh, now, what parts of the file do not exist? Well, because it doesn't exist, I can't say. What parts, to your knowledge, don't exist? Well, there are certain statements within the original investigation which are referred to in internal reports and so forth, which uh, cannot be found. This is one of the most damning aspects of the entire case. A senior police officer admitting that a file on the high-profile murder of an elected representative is missing. No explanation was proffered or excuse made. The RUC had simply and inexcusably lost it. If the murder file is open, I would expect it to be in a particular location. And that would be the location in which the murder investigation is being conducted. The investigation ran cold until 1999, when a former UDR man with a drink problem allegedly made a startling confession. It came to the attention of Pat Fahey, who was unable to persuade the police to take it seriously. About two years ago, this gentleman, David Jordan, uh, made a confession uh, in a local public house to a number of people uh, to the uh, effect that he had been present on the night and that he had seen the killing and he also named the people, members of the Ulster Defence Regiment who he said were involved in the killing. David Jordan was a farm labourer who joined the UDR in the early 70s and served in Oma and Ochnacloy. Insight has spoken to several of his friends and family about his claims and each of them said that they believe what he was saying to be true. Did you know David Jordan? Who is David Jordan? He was a member of the security force, member of the UDR back at that time. Well, I can't remember a David Jordan in the UDR, full stop. I'm aware of uh, Jordan, I'm not too sure he's David or not, who had a desperate problem with alcohol. Now, I don't think it's very wise for anyone to put much dependence on the word of someone who has alcoholic dependency. He didn't serve with you in the UDR? <coughs> no. You were never on patrol with the David Jordan? No. Don't mind that. But in an area where perception is as important as truth, the failure of the RUC to interview Jordan before his death in 1999 served merely to confirm suspicions that the case involved a cover-up. The RUC stood accused of failing the family not once but twice. Such a perception, while hard to dislodge, is all too prevalent in controversial murder cases. I should say that the Human Rights Commission has been approached by uh, quite a large number of uh, victims, usually victims of paramilitary violence, um, committed many years ago in some cases. Uh, and in those cases we have often approached the police for information uh, concerning the crime. Can it be reinvestigated? What exactly is the state of play? Has the file been closed? Is there evidence that 
can still be re-examined in the light of new forensic techniques, etc. Uh, the answers we get tend to be a bit um, opaque, a bit uh, unhelpful. Further questions over the police investigation surround a letter received by the Civil Rights Association in the period before Patsy Kelly's body floated to the surface of Lock Eyes, which claimed that detectives were ignoring evidence of serious crime by local UDR soldiers. It was an anonymous letter and it was written on the back of a traffic report form. Uh, it, I think a form number T6, or I think it may have been a traffic accident form. And in that form, it made allegations that uh, that a, a number of people uh, were suspected of being involved in the Patsy Kelly disappearance and was signed serving officers to the RUC. The handwritten original letter is now lodged at the Linen Hall Library in Belfast. Among those named as being involved in Patsy Kelly's disappearance is Oliver Gibson, whom it identifies as being a member of 6th Battalion of the UDR. RUC records confirm that Mr Gibson was first questioned at this time. As MacArthur confirmed, the UDR man was questioned for a second time in 1976 on the basis of an anonymous tip-off. Its exact nature he won't confirm. The DUP assemblyman suggests the political nature of the Civil Rights Association makes the anonymous letter a highly dubious piece of evidence. First of all, I doubt the origin of where the letter is supposed to have originated from. I don't know what Mr. Doris's sympathies are, good, bad or indifferent. But again, bear in mind what the orchestra was playing was a Republican tune to denigrate any UDR man who isn't wearing a uniform so there could be an excuse made that that person could be murdered. A close reading of the transcript between the solicitor and Detective Superintendent MacArthur does, however, paint a picture of an investigation that was, at the very least, botched from the beginning. MacArthur confirmed that blood and fragments of hair were found at the murder scene, along with buttons which didn't belong to Patsy Kelly. It appears that the original investigators had a definite line of inquiry. According to MacArthur, at least two suspects were identified. One of them was Oliver Gibson, who would be questioned about the killing not once, but twice. Were you questioned by anyone about the disappearance of Patsy Kelly before the body was found? No, I was never questioned by anyone. Were you questioned by police at that period? No, I was questioned by no one. Were you questioned by anyone connected to the, to the military at that stage? No, I was questioned by no one. Not, you were never questioned about never the Never questioned by anyone. Surviving police documents suggest detectives did link the theft of Mr Gibson's car to the murder. It was found burnt out the day after Patsy Kelly's disappearance at Escra, less than 10 miles from the scene of the murder. Police refused to divulge to Pat Fahey the precise nature of the link. Mr Gibson told a newspaper recently that his car was not stolen on the night of the murder, contrary to police records, which also confirmed that Mr Gibson provided them with an alibi for the murder. Oliver Gibson is at a loss to understand why he was regarded as a suspect. He is unable to provide an explanation as to why an alibi was needed or why he gave one. You see, I was asked about my own car, you know, and when I'd last used it, when I placed it, you know, where it, when I parked it, and all that. But that's the only questions I was, I was asked. Where were you on the night that the, your car was stolen? Well, as far as I remember, I was in bed. <laughs> And was, the, the only thing that burgers me about that is how somebody got the car out of the yard without me knowing it. That has always been the, the, the big thing was a surprise to me. So you would have been in bed the night that Patsy <clears throat> Kelly was murdered? Yes. You, you weren't on patrol? No. <clears throat> well, not, not, not if he was murdered the night that the car was stolen. 
I was told I was at home that night because in like, fact I was down, had a few drinks in the local in the local pub before that because uh, we had been fairly intense, fairly tiring, and I'd worked fairly hard, and I'd done some I think some business that evening. I just simply went off to get a beer and back home. No charges were proffered against Mr. Gibson, but the evidence to exonerate him has disappeared because of police ineptitude, a fact belatedly disclosed by Detective Superintendent MacArthur after two years of requests for information from the Kelly family. It was only when uh, I spoke to Mr. MacArthur in this office that he then told me that the original file was not available. There was no explanation for where the original file was, but he told me that all that was available were certain se secondary documents. Uh, by secondary documents, I, I understood them to mean copies of some documents, but uh, even in relation to that, he was extremely vague. It does appear from existing documentation that important evidence had been collated, including a bootprint traced back to security force footwear. Insight has discovered that fingerprints were also discovered, but understands that none of the suspects were fingerprinted. The Kelly family, promised a speedy investigation in the immediate aftermath of the disappearance, is still looking for answers 27 years on. Some people might be of the opinion of, um, you know, well, you know, it's been such a long time, surely maybe, you know, um, maybe things should be left to rest, you know, maybe there's no point raking up old wounds. Well, it's not an old wound for us because our wound hasn't had a chance to heal keeps getting deeper. I would invite any um, independent person to examine the file and to, to make a, a finding on what the attitude of their UC was. I would characterise it as evasion, obstruction and uh, you know, a clear unwillingness to wish to be helpful in any way towards the family of Patsy Kelly. The Kelly case raises several uneasy questions. Why did the RUC not arrest the UDR suspects and questioned them properly at the time. Why were they not fingerprinted? Were force orders governing a murder inquiry properly followed? Why was the forensic evidence, which only underscored security force involvement in the murder, not followed up? And how much of the original murder file now exists? Well, there are certain statements within the original investigation which are referred to in internal reports and so forth, which um, cannot be found. I'm not prepared to disclose that. Well, the original papers are not there. Well, are you prepared to tell us who, who made those statements? No. Uh, can't disclose that. The police ombudsman for Northern Ireland is now monitoring the Kelly case and is aware of the concern about the original RUC investigation and the missing files. There may be reasons why files are not available, but if I wanted a file and um, I was told it weren't available, I would you know, be quite assertive and aggressive about establishing that it really wasn't available and then looking at alternative ways of trying to get the evidence which may have been gathered and which may still rest somewhere else. Despite the suspicion surrounding UDR involvement in the murder of Patsy Kelly going back nearly 30 years, it is only in recent weeks, following two years of pressure from the Kelly family, that the police has asked the Ministry of Defence about the movement of UDR soldiers on the night of the murder. Insight understands that the police will make a decision on whether to re-examine the case in the light of the MOD response. How transparent that investigation will be is seriously open to question. Those files are confidential to the police and even a, an organisation like the Human Rights Commission has no power to compel the production of those files for our examination. So there's a certain inscrutability, a certain lack of transparency in, in the way that um, these, these investigations take place. The police service refused to be interviewed for this program, but just 12 hours before its transmission, it provided insight with a statement that only raises more questions than it answers. The police now claim to have found the Kelly file, along with other papers relating to a 1993 re-examination of alleged security force involvement in the murder of Patsy Kelly. They say these papers were incorrectly indexed and filed at their headquarters. But while the police were quite happy to tell us of their discovery, they had failed to tell the Kelly family. What the police won't say is just where the papers were found and what was the outcome of the 1993 re-examination of the case. 
Ronnie Flanagan has consistently claimed that all murder files remain open despite the fundamental changes to policing. But if his force lost the Kelly file in the first place and refuses to answer difficult questions, the chief constable's words are rendered meaningless. Until the truth comes out, until we find answers as to first of all why he was, why he was murdered, why it was uh, a flawed investigation initially, and since that, why um, his files have gone missing. I mean, it's, I find it quite an incredible situation and an extremely hurtful situation the longer it goes on and the longer that the truth is hidden from us. When one lives with this sort of uh, innuendo, an allegation that's never openly said, but always applied or implied, that not really that gets to anyone. And the fact that you're innocent, the best that one can say is you're innocent. And no matter how much I jump up and down, that doesn't prove me innocence anymore. But the truth of the matter is this. I had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with a man. I didn't know him. I didn't know he existed. The ineptitude of the RUC in investigating the Kelly case has meant that despite his protestations of innocence, Oliver Gibson cannot definitively end the campaign he says has been waged against him by Republicans. For the Kelly family, the lack of any meaningful investigation means that it's unlikely ever to know who killed Patsy Kelly on a narrow country road 27 years ago. Corner bar in Trillick.